Welcome. Um, funding tech startups. I am uh, David Hansen. I am a professor of entrepreneurship at the College of Charleston. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff that uh, I talk about quite a lot. So um, I'll, I'll, later on I'll have a what I call here a speed lecture. Otherwise I will take up the entire time lecturing because that's you, what we do. <laughs> Oh, sir. Yeah. yeah. We're not okay. Any, any. All right. Uh, and I'm Jim Nettles. Uh, I've worked in technology and business consulting for about 30 years. Uh, I work with a lot of startups. I'm also an author, a uh, speaker, but I do a lot of work around getting businesses stood up or dealing with businesses that are in trouble. So I'm going to be talking about things much more from a practical standpoint. Oh, now I can hear the echo. I'm here. <laughs> um, so a lot of the things I'll be bringing up will be coming from the practical standpoint. I actually right now am in the process of getting a company funded. Uh, I have worked with, I've been working with venture capital and other forms of capital funding for more than 30 years. Uh, I work with a number of incubator centers and incubator programs as well. Okay. You want to so um, one of the things that we wanted to start with was to sort of give a quick poll and see what direction you guys are coming from, what questions you might have, so we could tailor this a little bit to the audience. Who here is actually in the process of trying to get something started right now? Okay. Who out here has actually started something in the past? So what kind of fields, industries are you guys looking for? I know we're talking tech. Are you looking for software? Are you looking for uh, hardware, manufacturing? Kind of which fields are you guys interested in? <laughs> Excellent. So am I. <laughs> You'll want to come to our panel later tonight, but I'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. This one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I frequently they go, yeah, can you back the mic off? Um, <laughs> we can turn the volume down on you. Oh, well, okay. We'll be fine. <laughs> yes, please. We can talk about that offline. We we can probably get into that a little bit, but like I say, this is, you know, we can, we can touch on that when we get into the questions. And so like I say, this, you know, I know you've got a bit of a presentation. We want to hit some of the high points and then dive into it. And I want to make this as interactive as possible so that this is also of benefit to you guys. All right. Is this better? Excellent. Um, go for it. OK. Um, so speed lecture. Um, two general types of funding out there is equity, which is Somebody gives you money, and you give them a portion of your company. Sounds bad, but there are some good benefits to it. First of all, compared to debt, there is no monthly payment, so it's just cash in. Maybe. And with, well, <laughs> <laughs> general, okay. Um, generally, also with equity comes some kind of advice and support. Whether that's good or not uh, depends. Um, you're spreading the risk of your business um, and this is what you need generally for scaling you're not going to scale a business with your credit cards um, obviously cons you're not or you're giving up ownership um, that the equity uh, the uh, the people buying into your firm may push you in directions that you don't want to go depending on how much uh, control they have um, it's very difficult to find somebody to actually fund you uh, so you have to get very used to hearing no. Um, so debt, start out generally, credit cards, second mortgage, basically everything you possibly can. Um, reason for that is that you need to show other people that you believe in your idea enough that you're willing to risk everything. Otherwise, they're not going to risk everything. Yeah. And, and something to be aware of when you're, when you're looking at that really is, when you're dealing with investors, they want to know that you've got skin in the game. Uh, 
but so do lenders. So if you're going any of the tradi traditional paths as well, you're going to have skin in the game in terms of assets you're fronting, mm -hmm. you're going to have collateral, you're going to be backing it. When you're dealing with investors, you have to be aware of what their motivations are as well. Okay. Um, so with that, um, it's it's all yours, right? You're not you're not giving up ownership. Nobody's telling you what to do. Uh, the biggest problem is that cash flow is going out. And what I tell my students, very simply, as long as you have cash and you can pay your bills, you're still in business. When you run out of cash, that's when you're in trouble. So the most important thing, at least from that perspective, is holding on to your cash any way you possibly can. Um, all right, so. Um, generally, the stages of funding start with yourself, um, then friends, family, and crazy people who are willing to invest in you. Uh, uh, angel investors, generally these are um, former entrepreneurs, retired entrepreneurs. They go and move to, uh, like near us, uh, Kiowa, so they can golf all the time. They get bored. They want it, they have a lot of money, and so they want to get back in the game, but not actually spending the you know 24 hours a day working on building a business. So they invest and give their advice. Venture capitalists, um, this is where you're talking about millions of dollars uh, investment, uh, and there's corporate venture capital. Uh, corporations generally don't like to take risks on new ideas, so they invest in the new ideas for startups, and sometimes they'll invest in multiple different companies doing the same thing to see which one wins so they own it. Um, and then you have crowdfunding, which doesn't really fit any of the stages. Um, and I actually have a couple slides on that. Uh, first, I know this is kind of hard to read, uh, but um, generally this, there are four types. There's your donation type of crowdfunding where basically somebody gives you money to help you, you know, pay for surgery or whatever it might be. Um, rewards. Um, where you're selling, pre-selling something, um, then there's social causes uh, and equity. So um, you can see the, at the bottom there, it's the sizes of the amount of money. So the donations, obviously, you're not going to get a whole lot. Uh, average is 1.4 thousand. Um, the rewards programs, they're 4.6 thousand, etc. Um, but what you really want to know is well, what does it take to actually succeed in crowdfunding? And so uh, last year I went and looked at all the research that was out there, which wasn't a whole lot, on what actually has led to successful crowdfunding campaigns. Uh, so the most common thing that I saw and, and that I grouped up was uh, communication. So how do you communicate your message? Um, different ways work, being honest, passionate, uh, applying guilt, emotions, etc. Um, the thing that really stuck out to me, uh, and it tied everything together, was the network. Uh, a big thing I, I kept seeing is that those who were successful had built a network at, of interest in what they were doing before they launched the campaign. Because one of the re things that leads to a successful campaign is a good start, getting a lot of money quickly, because then you turn into a snowball, right? Um, so having a, a, a good start to your campaign, it's going fast, you're getting close to your goal, you're more likely going to be a featured uh, on Kickstarter or whatever. Um, so those kinds of things help. Um, having somebody uh, put in a lot of money very early. So if you have like, you know, you're, you're raising 10000 and you have a $1,000 uh, level and somebody puts that in right away, that's a, that's a good signal to other people that okay, well, maybe there's, this is something worthwhile. Uh, the closer it is to reaching the, the goal, the more likely people are going to uh, fund you. Uh, and of course, people do like having uh, stuff that they can get out of it. So uh, my general advice, oh, yes, go ahead. Sure, I can share them. Um, and I, this is being videotaped too. But uh, yeah, I, I, I can share. Um, um, my general advice always is that when you're trying to raise money, need as little as possible. Um, the less money you need, the less trouble you have to go through in either fighting debt or giving away your company to other people. 
Um, so in, if there's any uh, case where you have a choice to pay up front or delay payment or give somebody a share instead of paying them, give away a share um, for later on. So it might cost you more in the long run, but you're alive as a business in the long run. Um, if you can get something for free, do it. Anything you can do to avoid spending money, do so. Um, look for uh, business competitions that are out there. There's tons of them. Um, money um, that comes out of them. Um, go near a college campus and get some interns. Right? Um, and the other thing is sell. If you have something that people are willing to buy, sell it. One is that that's money coming in, but it's also market validation that says there are people willing to buy it. So when you're going out to try and raise money, you have evidence that people actually want to buy what you're selling. If you haven't sold anything, it's a lot harder to convince somebody to invest in you. If you're already selling a lot, that makes a big difference. Um, so that's basically my advice. It, need less money. And my take on it is going to be just a little bit different. It's about using money smartly and understand how much you really need to have. So a lot of what I have been drawn into over the years, and I've, I've operated on kind of all sides of a deal. I've been on the side of getting money funded. I've been on the other side of working for VCs and actually doing some of their due diligence work, evaluating technologies, evaluating the plans. The core things you have to remember are, A, no matter what else you're doing, if you are doing a startup, if you are starting a business, this is not a job. You really have to dedicate yourself if you are trying to get a business going. It is not a job. It is not eight to five. You, you, know, you, you don't plan that way. You can't look at your business and being a business owner as being a, a, just a job. A job is nothing more than being a mercenary and selling somebody your time. It really and truly is. You have to have that ownership and that, that mindset when you're going into it. The second thing is you have to be very cognizant of having a real plan. You have to understand what your real needs are and whatever you think you need, you need about double that as a general rule. Um, because there are things that will go wrong. No matter how good your plan is, no matter how conservative you are with it, there are going to be things that go wrong that you did not anticipate. So you want to make sure that you have got a plan not only that you're trying to execute against, but you can also use that to decide how well you're doing in executing against the plan. Because if you don't have it, you're not going anywhere. And then the final component of this is figure out who in your team and what their major benefits and challenges are with their skill sets, with their connections, with their relationships. Know and understand within your team what gaps you have and where, how you have to fill them. Because there is no one in any business outside of a single person who is doing something you know very small, very minor, who can do everything. I mean, even as an author, if I look at that side of some of the things that I do, I have an entire team of people. I have, and a lot of those are people I just pay. You know, that's editors, that's you know, artists, publicists, all of that sort of thing. You have to be, you know, you have to plan on the fact that you cannot do everything, and if you try to do everything, you will fail. You have to know where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, and even if something is on the plus side for you, and it's something you know how to do, you have to know if it makes more sense to have somebody else do it for you. Because if you are getting, especially if you're starting up a company, you need to know that you are the spearhead, you're the CEO, you're part of that C-level suite guiding it forward. You have to have people getting it done in the background because otherwise you're not going to go anywhere. Now that I've started with all the cheerful news. <laughs> <laughs> so it, the other part of this becomes when you're looking for funding, when you're looking for capital, when you're going out there and you're reaching out um, versus the days when I first started with this, when I was in college back in the 80s, I started working for an incubator center. Um, back in the days before they called them that, but that's really what we were. It was much more Wild West. 
don't get the idea that it's still, still not very much Wild West. There are some very good, very structured programs that are out there nowadays that will help bring you in and carry you through the process. Uh, and these are incubator programs both from different universities as well as private ones. Mm -hmm. You will find a lot of the time that you will find somebody who has a capital fund that they actually have their own incubator program. They have their own people internally and they'll start working with you if they accept you into the program before you get a dime. And they'll go through, vet your package, they'll start looking to see how well suited you are, and then you start working in the process. You may get to that point where you get angel investors that want to front some money for you. Well, one of the things you're looking for out of those angels is not only cash, you're also looking for the knowledge and expertise they can help bring to you and maybe help fill some of those gaps in your team because they'll have knowledge in business you may or may not have mm -hmm. or expertise and you'll start working that that way up the ladder but also you've got a lot of guys out there that are they have money they've got somebody that's a gateway once you touch that gateway you've got to know what you're working with I don't know, I don't know if you had yeah. it I don't know um, I don't know if you had a comment on that. Oh, no, no, no. I was just trying to see if I had a slide that uh, okay. tied in with that. So, for example, I mean, uh, this morning, I just got off a call with a project we're working to get funded. Uh, we're starting at about $8.5 million. Uh, we've got part of that capital raised. We're working with attorneys right now going through and vetting due diligence. Do not expect somebody to walk in the door and write you a check, even for fifty grand. Understand they're going to want to see a plan, and they're going to challenge you on that plan. And if you have feelings, check them at the door. They want to see you're committed. They want to see you're passionate, but they also want to see that you're professional about it. Uh, now, I'm going to hit a couple of other sides of that equation. And I, I think I said this earlier. When you start dealing with investors, know what their motivations are. Know and understand who you're dealing with because this is a partnership that's a whole lot harder to get out of than a marriage. Hmm. Because if somebody owns part of your business, and if they're motivated to do so, you know, you're going to see guys that if their money starts being at risk, they're going to start taking more and more control. It happens every day. It happens all the time. Look at Uber. Multi-billion dollar company, still losing money. Multi-billion dollar company, CEO's a jackass. He had to go. So don't ever think that even if you are a majority stockholder, you can't get pushed out once you go public. Yep. So before I keep rambling, does anybody have any questions before we dive into the next round? Wait. Hang on. Yeah. Catch. All right. Um, yeah, for the uh, – oh, it's a microphone. Oh, cool. Uh, <laughs> For the uh, the crowdfunding advice and everything, one of the things we've run into a while, a while back is the uh, shippable versus non-shippable product, ah. mm -hmm. and how that makes a huge difference on the crowdfunding of what you're tr what try trying to do. So for crowdfunding, and this is a really interesting thing, there are a number of services out there that do crowdsourcing and crowdfunding in a number of different ways. Understand what your needs are and your model are, and then pick the service that way. Uh, also, depending on what your products are, you're you may find some crowdfunders that won't allow you to use them depending on what you're trying to do and fund. Um, working with crowdsourcing and crowdfunding um, is not quite as good and strong as it was, obviously, when it first started because now there are a ton of projects out there, and one of the things that you can't always tell is how well have somebody planned out their funding. If you want to see a success story that exploded too well, look at Exploding Kittens the card game because they got millions and millions of dollars when they were looking for a small investment and it took them a long time to be able to produce enough inventory to deliver for their customers so when you're crowdsourcing and when you're promising swag and when you're promising kicks make sure you have the ability to deliver because if you don't that'll that'll cause you some problems and cause you some kickback they handled that overflow extremely well they communicated with their investors they communicated with their customers 
and they are a huge enterprise. I will give you the other side of this. Uh, there was a video com game company that started a simulator called Ants. Have any of y'all heard about this nice little scandal? They raised, I've heard the official numbers and the unofficial numbers, let's, let's gently call it a half a million. Um, they had the development funds, they were going through and starting into the code phase, they had the team, they developed the first prototype, and then they blew the rest of that cash on, I'm going to be very polite about it because it's early in the day, entertainment <laughs> of a very adult nature. And let's say not entirely legal consumables. <laughs> So when things like that happen and become public, then we as the public who may invest become a little more skeptical. So I may go and look at something that's a couple hundred dollar device that when you're crowdfunding like that, you're pre-purchasing. But mm -hmm. when you do that, you're accepting a liability with that. You don't really know what you're getting. You don't know what, what you're doing. So you have to look and act professionally like a real company, a real organization, a real entity, even in those startup phases. Because if you're not acting that way when you start up, you're never going to get there. Yeah. Okay, here's an interesting... Uh, can you hear me okay? All right. Um, when it comes to investors, um, how many, uh, since you're dealing with so many of them, um, I'm trying to phrase this right. How many of them are comfortable dealing with the semi-legal products that are out there? And what I mean by that is, is that 28 states, cannabis is legal, and I have a cannabis product online, but I'm looking for the investors that are out there, but how do I source those that are willing to deal with that industry? Uh, I can tell you an easy way to deal with that is to work with the people in the industry that are in a cash-heavy business that need a way to um, to bring it in legitimately. They are able to invest that cash, but a lot of the time, if you are in a in, if you're in a national or an international bank, mm -hmm. you can't deposit the cash. Right. I'm and I feel sure you're already sort of seeing and dealing with some of that. Funny as it is, my product doesn't touch the plant, so I can bank without any worries. So you have a built-in flock of investors with the ability to help basically launder their cash Never in a legal way. way. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> 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 I, I just won. <laughs> um, I'll send you a bill. Um, <laughs> do we have more? Sure. <clears throat> I, I don't know if you're going to touch on this or not or talk about it, but the importance of uh, when it's when it's a non-digital, like I will call it an analog product or mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. um, getting a patent. I've seen it's very important. I've seen who cares about it. I've seen just get a get a provisional patent. Get, don't even worry about it. Just take the product. To just put it out. There. I've seen all sorts of spectrum, and everyone has a different take mm -hmm. on it. I was curious if you had a take on getting a patent. Do you want to give an academic answer, and then I'll. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I'll say, I mean, just what I, I tell my students in general, a patent is a waste of money. But investors like to see it. So the provisional patent is usually what I will say. So, But remember, a provisional patent is only good for 12 months. So uh, if you do get an investment and they're really interested, the investors want to see that patent, then they'll pay the tens of thousands or help you in some way get that patent. Um, but yeah, provisional patent is generally what I'll tell students to do just because it, it, it shows that there's there's something there so and, and the answer is going to be a conditional it depends it depends on what your product is I always encourage you want to have some some degree of protection over your intellectual property because especially with investors that's what they're banking on so if you're looking for investors and you're looking for funding they're going to want to have that because it doesn't become a true tangible without having the intellectual property and those guarantees to lock onto. Now, here's the other side of that, is it, it can be a provisional patent. It depends on what the lifespan is of your product. 
and what you're intending to do with it. If you are spinning up a product that is intended to have a very short lifespan for something, um, for example, in the digital world, and I, I deal with this frequently because technology changes and evolves so quickly, um, there are times that you may just come up with a application, a piece of software, something along those lines, that you want to patent, trademark, and copyright because you know in 12 months that that application is no longer useful for that market. Um, for an example, I dealt with this some during the Y2K problem. Uh, where we had a lot of applications that were meant to do validation of engines, validation of systems, specifically for that. And so it had a very, very specific lifespan. We rolled them out, we got them up, they did what they did, they took that capital to then roll it into other new technologies. But that was a very limited lifespan for the product. If you are doing something, whether it's a tangible or an intangible, here's the other side of that. Sometimes you're, you're better off to actually let people take your product and run with it to build your market. As long as you are either better at it with a superior product or you're cranking out the cheaper version. But if you have that patent and you have the intellectual, the intellectual property, the reason it sort of can be useless to an extent you have to have the capital to defend it. Right. Um, now, and that's like billions of dollars, in some cases. In some cases, yes. I mean, I've been doing, I've been writing a series currently on intellectual property, copyrights, patents, this sort of thing, and, and the pluses and minuses, and when things move into public domain. Um, and one of these pieces is how can I use a product that moves into that freer open market? And sometimes that is to build your market. So maybe you have a patent on components of it, but let people go out there and start building your market so you, when you come in, you're that lead player. So you're talking about uh, new markets where the- New markets, emerging right. technologies. Right. Where so yeah, with, with a new market, one of the things you have to do is you have to essentially educate customers. And so if you, if what he's basically saying is let somebody else do that because that's time and money. That's time and money, and the first guy is often most likely to fail right. or get stuck. And if that happens, one of the things you can often do in those cases if you have a technology but you don't have the money is license it to somebody, let them turn it loose, mm -hmm. let them exploit the market, and if it works Plus or minus, you've you know you've got sort of a guaranteed income stream off of that for the period yeah. that they're doing the licensing without taking the risk. Yeah. First mover advantage really is an extremely rare case. Um, it's generally when you have some kind of network externalities. The more people that use it, the more valuable it becomes, like eBay. Uh, but that doesn't happen very often in most business models. Okay. So my question, I. You mentioned working with different products and making sure that you know you have a way to sell it or market it. Uh, in terms of something like new media or just like something that's entertainment based, like a film or a YouTube channel, that kind of thing, the only real successes I've seen in that is from something that has like a revival of an old show or something from a company that already has a built-in base that will definitely donate to it. Have you seen any way to successfully do that, like do crowdfunding for something of that nature from scratch without a built-in base, like a way to market or communicate it to an entirely new audience? Yeah, uh, it's called social media. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm being a little bit flippant about that um, and actually being here talking about that later today. Um, so we now live in a period of time with technologies that are available to us at very limited costs. I'm not going to refer to any of them as free because there are costs there. You may not be shelling out cash for them directly. There is no such thing as free. There, there are costs to using, I'm going to pick on Facebook for a minute because I've been on a rant. Um, <laughs> if you are a Facebook user, you exist for one reason. 
you exist to market to. You exist to service data. So everything that you do through social media provides data for those services. That's how they generate revenues. The ad revenues, everything else. You're a huge market to advertise to. So if you have a media soft product, whether it, let's say it's music, it's a book, it is a video, a film, there are a great number of channels and ways to get it out there. So um, I, I've got a friend of mine that's a filmmaker. He does both. He, he does a, a number of a multitude of both documentary style as well as you know dra dramatic films. And he, he's done a number of TV shows and things like this. Part of it when you're dealing with entertainment is the person. It's building you yourself as a brand. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people making a lot of money on YouTube just off of shares and videos. If you have something out there that you want to build and you have your Opus Magnum, you have that product you really want to get there, start with something smaller. Do things that help you build that presence so people have seen that two minute short video, that free song you put out there. These things like this will build you a presence. Understand you're going to have to invest some capital to get them out there and get the signal going. But if you can trigger that viral response, a couple of thousand in, in investment, invested in ad revenue will, will return that money through affiliate revenue off these other sources in a heartbeat and become funding sources. And that's what I have up here, the community familiarity. So getting people familiar with the work with these little two minute things or whatever it might be is one of the biggest things that will lead you to success because it ties in with so many other things so I mean I'd like to say look at st studying social media because that is transforming the way we operate as consumers I mean they, the number one thing I will add to this is and I meant to say this a few minutes ago the number one thing you need to do in your planning phases is define success. Because if you don't have that idea of what you define as success up front, you have a hard time knowing whether you're there or not. I mean, because if you don't know, you know, for example, let's, let's take a movie. Nobody expected clerks a small black and white film to become the phenomenon it did. They had fun with it. They built it out. It exploded. Nobody plans for that. A lot of the time you should. You should plan for success because sometimes success is harder than failure. Because if people are not prepared for an exploding success, South Park, um, <laughs> You know, something that starts off as a small project can become huge, and you have to understand there's a great deal of stress to having people all of a sudden in your business, to phrase it that way. I mean, to have people all of a sudden calling your phone at your doorstep, you know, tons of emails. I can't, you know, go through a phase where you can't pick up your phone. You have to have a new phone number for <laughs> your friends and family to talk to you. Um, but the other side of this too is define success. Is it selling 5,000 copies of a book? You know, I have a lot of friends in the author community that are B-listers making a really good living and considering it very successful and growing that. Um, so define success. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be like a, a number of something, a number of books or profit. It could just simply be that people get your message, that they like what you're doing. And if it's three people and you like that, that's good enough. So th you know, think creatively about what it is that, sh that you want to see. OK, this is going to be a chicken or the egg kind of a question. <laughs> Dinosaur. <laughs> I can really give you a better question than that one. <laughs> All right. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, the chicken or the egg question is, is how much marketing should you try doing before crowdfunding, 
or using the crowdfunding to do the marketing? Market before crowdfunding. You have to get enough signal yes. over the noise for anyone to care. Yes. But how do you target which social media circles you really want to chase after? What's your product? A flavor spray for cannabis and I need the right website to market it. So the first question you're going to have to identify is which social media outlets will actually allow you to advertise. Mm -hmm. I've already gotten a tentative letter of approval from Kickstarter saying they'll take it as one of their projects. So, so they'll, I could put it up there. Uh, again, and I like to say, for your particular scenario, again, you're going to kind of you're going to kind of be skirting some of that. Well, yes or no. Is uh, because you, well, so here's the part of the thing: if, when you go to do your Kickstarter or whichever crowdfunder you wind up using, right? You want to make sure you've got the video, you've got the pictures, you've got the write-up, you've got the copy, you've got a plan that people can see. Right. But again, the other side of this too is you want to be out there and advertising on Twitter and on, you know, you want to have a website to drive people to to say this is coming, mm -hmm. this is coming, this is coming. And you want to have a message there that people are entertained by. You want to have a reason that they're coming there and signing up on your mailing list and gathering a built-in crowd mm -hmm. So when that crowdfunding hits, right. you can email 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 people the day it rolls out and say the crowdfunding is here. Yep. We need your money today to make this grow if you want this product. Exactly. Uh, and, and so a lot of, or several of the studies that I had read, they actually weren't even advertising initially. They just were going into wherever that community gathers online. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it's some discussion boards, whatever, you start interacting, get to know the people, they get to know you, um, and you know, you're not there just selling your product, you're there talking about stuff, which sometimes may include talking about your product. Um, and then so people know you, they start following you, they start telling people, and then, then you can start working on advertising. So start building that community. Again, the community, getting that community known, that they know you, is just, it's really critical. Uh, and it tie again. It did. That's the thing that ties, from what I've read, uh, on research. That's what really ties into all of the successful crowdfunding. Yeah, and and it is participation in community. And when I say participation, I truly mean participation. It's not buy my product, buy my product, buy my product. It's not fund me, fund me, fund me. Mm -hmm. Because if you come in that way to a community, you're going to get bounced very quickly. If you come in and you're a contributor to the community, then the community will want to support right. you. And that's true both online in the digital world, and that's just as true at home. I mean, so. you, you have to build those relationships, and you have to make, you know, people want to do business with people they like, <laughs> or at least entertain by. Absolutely. Um, and that, that's one of the things I write about a lot is know your tribe, build your tribe, and ultimately one of the things you want to be is one of those leaders in the tribe so when you're launching something, they're coming to you. Again, with your particular products, there's a different tact I probably would take other than crowdfunding. I think you have a, a very different, much better open market to get funded faster with more money and then also have a built-in distribution network once you're done. That, uh, that is true sometimes, it is not as true as you might think. Because you, there is, again, you're trying to get signal over noise. Mm -hmm. To achieve that level of advertising in return, you're gonna need something people are coming to for another reason. You're gonna need that video that people wanna see that is funny, mm -hmm. or that is entertaining, that's coming in, that, that that's why they're coming there, and then they're like, all right, that was funny, I'll give them five bucks just because I was entertained. Mm -hmm. That's where that benefit comes in from crowdfunding. And, and building that name and that. So, I mean, think about things like shake weight, okay? <laughs> it was a very short-lived product out there that made a ton of money. Again, it wasn't out there for very long. It hit a cultural meme. It sold. The creators of it made a ton of money. And nobody's heard about it since. 
again, this is the, the length of product and knowing your products and knowing your okay. audience and having something and a way to present it that is going to draw attention. Other, yeah. Mm -hmm. But this also goes back to to uh, you know the, the issue of growth. Um, you don't necessarily want to, or need to get everybody to know about your product, especially if you're not ready to sell to everybody. Um, one of the things that, um, if, if, the, if you're familiar with the Lean Startup and Steve Blank, one of the things he talks about is early evangelists. So you're finding those people that are really passionate about whatever it is that you're selling, and they will start basically marketing for you by telling people, oh, this is really cool. Can't wait for this to come out. Why don't you go and, and you know contribute too, because I want to see it happen. So find those people and be best friends with them. Aside from uh, sales, which is always great, uh, can you speak to talking to like angel investors and VCs who they may be investing in the tech market, but doesn't exactly mean they know tech in general? This is actually a lot of the reason I get pulled into projects <laughs> is because I know the financial and the money side. I also know the technology side and I have resources I can draw on with specific expertise. So when I get a call, or, or when somebody is trying to get me to help build their package and presentation for that market. A lot of the time, angel investors operate in a small vertical, not because they necessarily know it, but because they got into it, they enjoy it, and they know it well enough. But especially when you're dealing with angels, they're looking for something that they can understand or that somebody can explain to them. So a large part of what I get brought in to do, you know, yeah, I may crank out numbers and everything else, it's taking a complex concept frequently and making it easy for them to understand. Because if you're dealing with somebody who is sitting on a pile of 5 million, 10 million, 50 million, 100 million in cash that they're looking to bundle into a multitude of investments, one of the things you have to look at and understand is they're not looking to invest in you. They're looking into a bundle of projects out of which to invest because they're looking to get a 30 to 40 percent return overall over a period of time, knowing that probably two of those projects are going to fail, one or two are going to languish and they'll, they'll do okay, they'll make a little bit of money off of it, and one of them is going to boom. That's the way VC works. So they want to understand what's the risk, what's the benefit. The conversation they have is, what's your market? How well can you deliver? And you know, how well are you planned out? How well do you know what you're doing? I don't want to know the technology. I want to know if it's shiny. The other thing to think about, and, and this goes for any kind of technology to anybody, what's the benefit of it? Mm -hmm. Nobody cares how something works or what features it has. They want to know what it does for them. So if you look online, um, there's uh, uh, some videos and stuff by um, uh, Clayton Christensen talking about jobs. People hire things to do something for them. Uh, and there's a video he talks about how uh, working with a, a burger company, didn't say it's pretty much McDonald's or Burger King, one of the two. Uh, they were trying to figure out how to sell more milkshakes. And so they did a study and found that most people buy milkshakes in the morning. Why? They need something. They're hiring a milkshake to keep them occupied while they're driving an hour to work, um, and they want something to fill their stomach. They don't care what it is, right? It's what is it that they're buying. It's a, so if you're making something, you're trying to sell it to people, why do they want it? And if you can communicate that to anybody, you can communicate it to an angel that knows nothing about tech. I think we had another. Hi, uh, I'm coming out of Lift Field. Um, my, com my company is, uh, we're a biotech startup, and uh, we've talked to some people, uh, some uh, accelerator funds out west, and gave our pitch. And they said that we really love your idea, we think it'll make a lot of money, but give us a prototype, we give us a prototype and we'll fund you. But being a biotech company, we have a bit of a higher activation energy than you know, a standard uh, uh, software company. And so um, we went, you know, we already planned, you know, planned to get shut down if we if possibly. So we had enough money to put by to build our molecular biology lab from scratch and go. And we're, we're getting ready to have our prototype ready. And we were wondering, you know, is, is this a common, you know, 
how could we have, could we, is there a way we could have avoided that issue though? You know, could, could we have, how could we have been more persuasive up front so that we didn't, you know, we, we could have jumped, jump, we, we'd be much farther ahead if we got an initial investment, you know, than, than if we self-funded, but we, we managed to do it, but is there a way we could have avoided that? So, so. Well, and without seeing the specifics, I'm gonna speak in, in general terms. There's a couple of tacks I probably would have taken. Number one is you might have found a, a lab that you could actually contract and go into instead of having to build a lab. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were in a maker area, you might have been able to find the CRISPR lab or something along those lines where you could actually just lease the services, preserve some capital instead of having to build your lab. Um, You'd be amazed what you can find on eBay, by the way. No, I, I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And if you really need to be entertained, come to the panels when I'm talking about how to destroy the planet. Um, <laughs> but there are services out there. Preserve your capital. No, spend your money wisely. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have something like that that is, have I made it? Can I actually make it? That's going to be the question. That's when you're looking for an angel to give you the capital to do the proof of concept. Um, and that often takes finding the right person. And again, that takes connections. That takes going to, I mean, there is a convention out there for anything and everything today. Mm -hmm. Go to where the people that you would be your customers yeah. are. Go to the places where your suppliers would be. Go to the places you would hire resources. Go to those places. Be there pitching your idea, pushing cards, pushing flyers, have a website to push people to. Mm -hmm. Whether you're moving a niche technology product that is geared for the Department of Defense or I am pushing out the new, you know, whatever, go to where those people are because if, they're, if they start hearing about you, it gets into that collective unconscious side of, I saw a card from these guys. I saw this. I saw that. I saw that. Presence is a large part of success. And so when you go to these things, that's when you'll discover the guy sitting in the back who's sitting on some money, who happened to be there for something else, and liked you. They may like the idea, they liked you. They trusted you. And it's, it's just as much about you as the individual mm -hmm. as it is your plan and anything else. You know, I, I've worked with partners before where they're like, do not ever put that person back on a call again. But going back to a uh, prototype of something that was, it's difficult to make, one of the things you can just simply do before you even have know how to build it is make a video mm -hmm. of, of how it works. Um, and there's, uh, again, another example uh, that I, I use in class is um, outlet baby monitors. Um, they won a, a, a competition uh, for their business model uh, years ago. And um, during their presentation, they talk about how they created a video for how their monitor work would work. They hadn't built anything. They just put it up on YouTube, and then all of a sudden it blew up. Um, they were contacted by news agencies, and they actually bought the suppliers and said, we're ready to you know, you know, build a, get a contract with you. Um, so you don't actually have to have something that works. Just show what it would look like or how it would work or what the benefit would be in a video and you can and do that pretty easily yeah I mean the keys to today are having video having good content and and doing those things to build presence <laughs> I mean no matter what it is you're doing you have to have stuff that people can look at and refer back to um, so I mean it, having a video having a, a brief video I had to do one for a project a couple of weeks ago that was being pre presented to an engineering conference and I couldn't get my guy to do the voiceover so I had to sit there and do the voiceover. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's preparation. I mean, it's have the tools in your, you know, have the tools in your pocket. Do we have any more? Questions? We're running close. Yeah. Sure. or the VCs are going to want to, like percentage of the company when you're selling it? I know it's um, a big question with a lot of- They want as much there. as they can get. They want right. as much as they can get for as little as they can give. Right. 
because, and this was where I was going back to the motivation. All right, I'm going to tell a quick horror story. Uh, I worked with a client a number of years ago where I actually was representing the VC, um, and we were going through the, the funding exercise and the funding conversations, and they said, we want a minimum of 75% of the company. We'll do an equity buyout over time where you can repurchase the company. We want 75% of the control. Um, and I went and told the client, I wouldn't do it for the amount of money they're funding up. A lot of them are going to try to, the first pitch is going to be, I want 55%. I want to have control, not necessarily day to day, I want to have strategic control. And this goes back to, you also have to trust the other side. You have to trust the guy with the money because I will absolutely tell you, I have been preaching this to one of my partners. A bad deal is much worse than no deal at all. So I will tell you this, I much prefer dealing with a number of smaller investors, giving them equity swaps and have the exit strategy on the table than the one guy who has the purse strings. Now, sometimes you're going to have that right partner, and I've worked with a few of those guys in the past. They are, they are much fewer and far between. Um, as a general rule, the guys that are going to want the, the majority equity that are in there are going to want to be active to some extent. You're gonna, they're going to have at least one of your C-level suite positions. A lot of the time they like CFO. Um, they're going to want to be it, they're going to want to have part of the controlling seats on the board, and they're going to also can hold. They may say you have 12 million in the bank, but every month you're going and saying, "I need to draw down to get some of that money in." Just because you've got access to capital doesn't mean you have the capital. And I will go back to my general advice: the the less money you need, the generally the less equity you're giving up. Right. So I mean, it's. It, if you go down to just a basic formula, right? It's it's what's the value of your company, how much are you asking for, and that figures out how much equity. Uh, so to increase the value of your company, sell, right? Um, because that that leads to um, one, it, it leads to led less risk, and and that's that's what you know uh, uh, angels and VCs are looking at. They're looking at how risky is this. The riskier it is, um, the more they're going to want. So if it's less risky, it's a, you know, it's a safer bet. You know, if you've already got, you know, 100,000 users, um, then it's you're 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 not gonna you have a much better um, standing point for negotiation. And the other thing, from a funding standpoint, when you're working with investors, and I I think I, I said this, you know, frequently they've got equity, but there's times you can do blends of money. Um, I've I've set up deals before where. It costs more on the front end, you know, and I, I do talk about preservation of capital, preservation of cash, but if you know what your cash flows look like they're really going to be, you can offer somebody, you know, say a percentage of revenue straight off the top, straight off the cash flow without giving equity. Um, there are ways to do it. Don't expect VC to be cheap money, especially the, more, the greater the risk, the more they're going to want to have and the more it's going to cost to buy them out. But the number one lesson I would always preach to go with that is have the exit strategy built into them for the investor. Mm -hmm. Know if they're going to have a holdback. It's going to be very common. You're going to find guys that are going to front and want 20, 50 percent. You're going to buy them out entirely, but they're going to have a 5 percent holdback, 2.5 percent holdback. They're always going to have that. They don't want any controlling interest. They just want to keep getting the res residual money off of it because they're taking that, and that's what they're, they're using to fund. Thank you. Thanks. Um, kind of what I what I'm interested in is uh, I'm in the planning stage, and my first business I didn't have to actually do a plan because the way it, it worked out, we just kind of took over a space and we kind of continued what they're doing, did our own thing. But it was it was basically a similar uh, um, business type. But anyway. So I didn't have to do a plan then, but now what I'm looking at, I, I need a plan. I need a good plan. And I've, I've approached SCORE, and I might as well not even gone to SCORE because they're, I don't know, it was just not very good at all. I mean, basically, especially with what I'm interested in doing, it was like talking, you know, I, I might as well have been, you know, an alien speaking to, you know, they had no idea what I was talking about. So 
I know you mentioned incubators. Mm -hmm. um, as far as getting advice and, 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 and plan preparation and, and things like that to actually, you know, go to investors and go to banks or go to whoever that's going to, you know, can, can fund money. I want a good plan and I, I, I would like, you know, uh, I'm trying to find some way to get a good, you know, place where I can get a, you know, good advice and to, to get a good, to get a good plan together to, to, to approach VCs. Is, is, is incubators a good way to do that or? Incubators are a good way to do that. I will tell you this as well. If you don't have you will find a lot of books out there. You'll find a lot of programs about telling you how to put together a business plan. I've yeah. written a number of these books um, and, and articles and things like this over the years. You may find, you, at, a, at a bare minimum, no matter what, you don't want to be the only person whose hands have been on that plan. Yes. You know, it may be the incubator vetting it out for you. The incubators often will have somebody in there to help you build plans. Um, but when you go through all of this, it, th there are people that can help you do this. There are people that do it very well. Um, there are people who don't, but uh, where do you live, just out of curiosity? Uh, Birmingham. Birmingham. Yeah. Um, I have not dealt with their program, but um, University of Alabama does have an incubator center. Okay. Um, now I'll tell you, you have to go through and apply, so you have to have your game, you have to have a pretty good game face on before you walk in the door. So you need to have some plan walking in the door. Okay. So when you're talking about plan, or is it that you know exactly what you're doing and you're just figuring out how to write it, or you're still figuring yeah. out what you're doing? Uh, no, I know okay. exactly what I'm doing. Okay. It's, just, it's basically, you know, something that's, I guess, you know, so when I present it to an investor, they're going to, you know, they're going to, you know, at least, you know, uh, I, what I'm trying to say, basically, it's, it's not going to be, you know, a poorly written plan that they're going to be like, what is this, you know? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> what, the, what they're looking for is, have you done studies? Do you understand what your market and who your customer is? Yes. Do you understand what your product is? Yes. Are you sure you understand what your product is? Yes. Um, you'd be amazed. Uh, if you know those two things and you know roughly what you think you need in money, if you've got those three things, because the number one thing people want to know is, who are your customers? Who's going to buy? You know, what's your market? Because... Uh, again, no matter what you're doing, the number one job of any company is to sell. The number one job of everybody in your company, especially on your leadership team, is to sell. Whether that's to sell your project, whether that's to sell your product, whether that's to sell the plan to get funding. You're always selling something. Uh, I, and I'll add, uh, the, in academia and entrepreneurship, we are moving away from even teaching business plans because you know the, the the old rule of thumb is they're outdated as soon as they're printed. So they're um, it's really just sort of like the way I tell it to my students is it's more like it's a resume. It's just something to get you in the door. Um, so it it doesn't have to be necessary. I mean, as long as it's you know proofread, you know there's a bunch of spelling errors and all that kind of stuff in it. Well, and I, I will tell you what I've gone to these days for business plans. They primarily are a PowerPoint deck that presents all the fundamentals, mm -hmm. key, uh, key slides that sort of sum, you know, cash flows, balance sheets, P&Ls over the first five years, uh, and then, you know, back it up with detail with tons and tons of spreadsheets and whatnot. It's not like the old days where you've got a Word doc that's, you know, 50 pages that it really, it's, it's it, again, when you're trying to sell for these guys know your, know your audience and so when you're trying to sell yeah. to somebody for capital you got to ha you know have your three pitches have your elevator pitch you know what does it take to get in the door have your longer pitch that is the 2 minute i got your attention so let me let me run this by you and then have your story yeah um, we as people want a narrative we want that connection so you want to have a narrative to your business and your personal story so that when you do that, you can make that connection. But your plan does not have to be these mega things like they used to be in the past. Yep. The business plan, the, the fundamentals to it are having something that you can use to operate from and know how you're doing. Yep. yep. Uh, j and just really quickly, there's, um, I can't remember his name, but the guy who started uh, Justin TV, uh, he did a talk at Stanford, there's a video up there, and it's somewhere in the middle of the video, he tells exactly what you want to do for your two minute, your five minute, and your 20 minute pitch, and it's, it's perfect. 
Um, so if you can find that, watch it. I share it with my students, um, and they're like, oh, wow, okay. So I appreciate it, guys. Um, and I think you have the charity pitch. No. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, everybody.